Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show, everyone. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. And everyone, hey, welcome back into the program. Uh, today on the show, we have computer and technology news for the whole hour, and you can be sure to catch that here in just a moment. Uh, until then, everyone, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, past shows, future shows, all the shows, podcasts, uh, articles, reviews, product, uh, you know, kind of product, exposés, links to social media, and more. If you can't catch us live on IRN, then that is the second best place to catch us, would be, of course, our website and our podcast. Podcasts are also available wherever podcasts are heard, and with Apple recently looking to uh, start charging people for premium podcasts, we want to let you know that, hey, uh, Computer America will never go down that road, but, you know... um, I'm sure that there's a time and a place and a certain subset of people that, you know, just like selling information about how to sell real estate and realize your wildest dreams and that kind of thing. Uh, You know, yeah, the information is probably out there, but maybe some people would like to curate it all in one place just to have it available and, you know, make a little bit of money off of it. But that is not us. We're here to bring you the latest news, latest products, latest guests, and hey, just have a fun time talking about all of it. So with that being said, everyone, one last time, ComputerAmerica.com, and let's go ahead and get started with uh, today's program, which we have a lot of different stories, uh, you know, and it's, uh, there's a lot going on, so I'm happy that we can definitely uh, bring this to you. So everyone, Computer and Technology News, brought to you by Computer America. So our first story that we're going to do is, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Hmm. We have a lot. Um, yeah, we have a lot that we can talk about here. Let's go ahead and talk about, hmm. How about, okay, that one's actually great. We'll start with some serious hardware. And when I mean serious hardware, I mean hardware that, uh, it really changes lives and really changes, um, a lot of things. And I think it's going to be this one, Microsoft and the United Kingdom oh, are going to be making one of the most powerful, or at least, uh, currently the world's most powerful weather supercomputer. And this is pretty nice. This is by, uh, yeah, uh, this is by S. Shaw from Engadget. And essentially the new system is twice as fast as the Met Office's existing Cray XC40. And Cray, if you're not familiar with them, they're essentially one of the largest producers of supercomputers out there. So they're, uh, yeah, you know, this is, this is going to be big. Saying that the British are taking their obsession with the weather to new heights, today the UK announced it is advancing its project to build the world's most powerful climate and weather supercomputer uh, with the help of Microsoft. Saying that the country's weather service, the Met Office, has, which I had no idea that's uh, what their national weather services. Uh, obviously, you know, we have the national weather services here in the United States. They have the Met, and uh, has struck a multi-million-dollar deal in agreement with the tech company on the project, which previously earmarked 1.6 billion dollars of government funding. So while the UK already boasts a super a weather supercomputer, which can perform, by the way, 16 trillion calculations a second, so that is their existing one, the new machine will be twice as powerful. And by gaining access to more detailed climate modeling, the UK is hoping to future-proof its city and transport infrastructure to protect them against extreme weather events. The system will be located in uh, in the south of the UK and will be powered by 100% renewable energy. Energy. It's expected to set up about, uh, I'm sorry, the setup will save about 7.500 tons 
of CO2 in the first year alone. Not half bad. And according to scientists in the Climate Coalition, England uh, England has experienced a major flood almost every year since 2007. So I guess that's, you know, wondering why would you build a second one if you already have one? And I guess the answer is that, that, you know, hey, it's, um, you gotta, you gotta start somewhere and, uh, they have a great one, but getting more detailed information, better information. And with that modeling, you know, if they can turn, let's say they get two days heads up, that something's going to be a major flooding event. If they get three days or four days, that's a lot of extra time to start preparing for everything from major floods, heat waves, um, you know, uh, weather systems, storms, stuff like that. All that super important to, uh, um, you know, make sure that it doesn't cause a catastrophe because if you see it coming, you can you can prepare for it. So, with that being said, naturally, Microsoft has been uh, brought in because of its expertise in cloud and quantum computing. The company has invested one billion in startup in OpenAI's Azure hosted supercomputer built to test large scale artificial intelligent models, and this one features. 285,000 CPU cores. That's a lot of processors. Keep that in mind. Your average PC will have, you know, somewhere between two to eight, maybe 16 if there's hyperthreading involved. Uh, you know, two to eight. This thing is looking at 285,000 CPU cores and 10,000 GPUs. And you know for sure those GPUs are going to be top of the line, you know, some of the best GPUs that you can get out there. Microsoft says that the machine is equivalent to the top five fastest systems in the world. Currently, the title is held by Fugaku, which is in Japan. So, yeah, supercomputer. You know, it's um, it's one of those things. It's kind of like having a space a space program or uh, kind of like having, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, the biggest aircraft carrier or, um, you know, kind of the best this or the best that. It is a little bit of a uh, measuring contest, let's just say, but at the same time, it does have real world implications and you can actually do something with this. So it's a little bit of showboating, but a lot of useful data that I'm sure that the UK will be sure to, uh, you know, really benefit from. So if there's one contest that uh, is worth having, I really do believe supercomputers super might be up there with one of the best things you could do. So there's the first story. Uh, pretty simple. And hey, I'm, let's see. I'm hoping that they're, they said by next year, they're hoping to have this thing up and running. It's, um, and again, one last time, it's to future proof its cities and transport infrastructure to protect them against extreme weather events. Every, every country should have access to one of these. And, you know, most, uh, most first world countries do actually have uh, these kinds of things in line. So there's the first one. Uh, the second story, let's go ahead and you may not know this because, you know, being Computer America, I'm not uh, going to beat around the bush here. Computer America has a, an, an America centric, or I'm sorry, an American centric, uh, audience. So for our friends down in Argentina, well, turns out that the Ar- the Argentine version of Google accidentally, well, not, well, I mean, I'm sure it was accident by Google, but yeah, the, uh, the Argentine version of Google temporarily collapsed, uh, temporarily uh, collapsed for about four hours. And they said that was due to the domain i.e. the google.com.ar. .ar, of course, is the local dom- domain of Argentina, uh, had expired on Wednesday, April 21st at midnight. And a particular internet user thought it'd be fun to, uh, you know, kind of claim it for himself. Because uh, just like if you were starting up your own website, if you wanted to register uh, randomwebsite.com and, you know, uh, the time comes to renew the, you know, renew it and you forget it slips your mind. You just don't do it. You would, you know, someone else would purchase it and then you have to wait and you have to either hope that they give it back or yeah, just figure out what to do otherwise. Uh, so Google has the same problem that so many business owners out there have as well. Turns out that, uh, this kind of led to the entire collapse of Google in Argentina. 
They said that uh, for about $540 local, or about $4 here in the United States, uh, that led to a temporary shutdown of the search engine in .ar. So these actions, however, had no impact on the international Google.com, just simply the, Argentine, the Argentinian version of the site. And that it would seem that Google Argentina forgot to renew the site, uh, and a user seized the opportunity to register it in his name. Obviously, this would be called cyber squatting, where, you know, uh, back in the early days of the internet, there were people who registered, you know, bed.com, coke.com. Uh, they registered, you know, very short, very succinct, and obviously very trademarked versions of websites, and then they would, uh, they would go into negotiations to sell it for much more than they registered it. So they said that he said on, on his Twitter account that I want to clarify that I entered uh, he when he entered it uh, he saw the name of google.com to ar available and he legally bought it as uh, it was uh, I'm sorry he legally bought it as appropriate and he said that uh, it is all legal he said so however minutes after the maneuver he uh, it was confirmed that google had already recovered the domain users complained about the failure of the website for at least three hours but when everyone suspected that the server had crashed as is often the case uh the twitter posting revealed the truth and that you know the reason why people felt it for hours after even though it only lasted minutes is because you know, waiting to refresh those certificates, uh, you know, that little handshake that your browser does uh, to for it to propagate throughout the internet, uh, you know, make sure that the, uh, you know, kind of all the backend stuff was properly aligned and synced up. That can take a couple of hours, uh, you know, when working with websites. So, there you go. Uh, neither Google nor the registry have commented on the incident. In fact, uh, the NIC.AR site was out of service uh, around 11 p.m. Wednesday due to the flood of visitors who found it, uh, who found out about the case through social media. By that time, it was no longer reg uh, the uh, the gentleman who purchased the domain was no longer the owner of the domain. And according to the Open Data uh, Group, they said that Google's domain had not expired. In fact, the expiration date was in July, but the group was too, uh, but the group two wasn't able to explain what had happened or why. So there you go. Sounds like someone somewhere fat fingered something, and it was supposed to expire in July. Instead, it expired in uh, in what month? Yeah, April. Yeah, where um, it's. Uh, it expired in April, and there you go. It's uh, it was all just one big accident, and hey, you can't even fault Google for making the same mistake. But you know what? People who do that, and it sounds like this guy was going to stick to his guns, saying that it was all legal, it was all on the up and up. I have to say, that's a really weak argument to say that he wanted to, uh, you know, kind of gain access to this. And obviously, the implications of if he actually were to be allowed to keep it he could redirect that site to anywhere that he wanted to so he could own google.com.ar and he could redirect it to his own site which may be full of malware may be full of ads um you know maybe to the highest bidder you know who kind of uh, gets it and everyone who visits it would then be redirected to this guy's mercy uh, right now, obviously, people go to google.com.ar to go to Google and not this gentleman's site. So there was really no, like, yes, it was legal. Yes, he really didn't technically do anything wrong. But clearly, should he have been the owner for that and should he be allowed to keep that? Probably not because, yeah, the, it was currently being used and will continue to be used by the original company who made it popular. So. There you have it. Uh, just a couple of minutes can make a lot of headache for a lot of people. So, story number two. Story number three. I actually want to do this one uh, if I can find it here. Story number three is actually about... Foxconn's going to be a really big story today. Signal, though. This one's, this one's actually a lot of fun. And... I think when people think about services and hackers and that kind of thing, uh, you know, whenever law enforcement hacks, let's say Apple, and they find a way around the password, or whenever uh, so and so encryption specialists find a way around a particular, um, you know, kind of security feature, 
I almost get this feeling like uh, sometimes people think that the companies who are being exploited or the companies who are being hacked, um, they just need to kind of accept that, you know, oh, no, we've been beaten. This is it. Uh, not so much the case here. And as far as Signal goes, if you don't recall what Signal is, it's an end-to-end -end encryption uh, chat service. Well, turns out the developers turned the tables on the forensic firm Celebrite, who famously said that they, uh, yeah, they they hacked and defeated Signal's um, services. So with that being said, Israeli digital forensics uh, firm Celebrate, which, you know, something about Israel and <laughs> this is not going to get political or anything like that. I just got to say that Israel has a pretty big cybersecurity uh, arm to it. You know, uh, whenever I hear about these, uh, you know, these different services and these different uh, hacks, Israel is, you know, just as popular as any other uh, country out there when it comes to digital forensic firms. So I don't know what it is about that. I, w I would love to know the story behind why Israel is such a hotbed for that, but here we go. Um, yeah, and you can see this uh, nice little image here that they provided. So for years, Israeli digital forensics firm Celebrite has helped governments and police around the world into uh, break into confiscated mobile phones, mostly by ex exploiting vulnerabilities that went overlooked by device manufacturers. So essentially what they did was they collected uh, they collected zero day exploits, exploits that were not really seen in the wild or exploits that were uh, not really common. And then they would save them. And whenever law enforcement had a phone that they needed to break into, because legally, you know, you don't have to give up your you don't have to give up your pin. You don't have to you know gain access thanks to the nice little Fifth Amendment that we have. Uh, but. Hey, if the police can hack into it, then more power to them. So they would take it to these guys and they would break into the phones. Now, on Wednesday, and they say that uh, on Wednesday, Marlon Spike, who is the uh, creator of the Signal app, published a post that reported vulnerabilities in Celebrate software that allowed him to execute malicious code on the Windows computer used to analyze devices. The researcher and software engineer exploited the vulnerabilities by loading specially formatted files that can be embedded into any app installed on the device. Essentially, the hack, uh, let's see, the hacked company took a little vengeance and hacked the hackers. Although the hackers were not, you know, just some run of the mill, you know, scary people, but they were a a legitimate cybersecurity firm who you would think would be a little bit more resistant to efforts like these. Now, they said that there are virtually no limits on the code that can be executed, he wrote. He continued, for example, by including a specially formatted but otherwise innocuous file in an app on a device that is scanned by Celebrite. It's possible to execute code that modifies not just the report being created on the scan, but also all previous and future generated Celebrite reports from all previously scanned devices and all future scan devices in any arbitrary way, saying that they can, insert, uh, they can insert or remove text, emails, photos, contacts, files, or any other data with no detectable timestamp changes or checksum failures. This could even be done at random and would seriously call the data integrity on Celebrate's reports into question. So it sounds like Celebrate has their own scanning software and their own software that they use to, you know, kind of scan devices, bring out contacts, photos, text, emails, that kind of thing. This executable code that the Signal developers were able to put into the software was able to run the code and essentially overwrite or work with the information that would be spit out by Celebrate. Indeed, it would call all of it into question. Now, Celebrate provides two software packages, the UFED breaks through locks and encryption products, and the physical analyzer uncovers digital evidence. So uh, they say trace events. Think about if you delete a photo, if you delete text, if you delete emails, their software would be able to get that information that would previously be lost back. 
All that being said, uh, they have a quote here saying that looking at both UFED and physical analyzer, though, we were surprised to find that very little care seemed to be given to their own software security. Industry standard exploit mitigation defenses are missing and many opportunities for exploitation are present. I think that the main reason for that is the software that they run is not available in the wild. You cannot go to their website, download their software, and use it yourself. It's probably used in-house, and it is probably used only on devices that are physically brought to them or sent to them. Uh, You know, they probably did not feel the need to actually secure the software because the software in general should not be really exposed to the population at large. Uh, It should only be used on devices that they physically have. So why would you, you know, it's not available on the app store. Why would you need to, uh, you know, really protect it? So here we are. Now, one example of this lack of hardening was the inclusion of Windows DLL files for audio video conversation software known as FMMPEG. I'm sorry, FFMPEG. The software was built in 2012 and hasn't been updated since. Uh, Marlon Spike said that uh, in the intervening nine years, they have received more than 100 security updates for FMMPEG, which none of those fixes were bundled in the Celebrite products. So they did not, you know, and uh, that's pretty common, you know, that you have this very base level product that is included but never updated. Uh, So, yeah, there's uh, about 100 security exploits that they can, uh, you know, really get to in one product right there. Now, they also included a video that shows the UFED as it parses a file he formatted to execute arbitrary code, and the payload uses message box Windows API to display a benign message, Uh, but Marlon Spike said that it's possible to execute any code, and a real exploit payload would likely seek to undetectably alter previous reports. And they mentioned even perhaps at random or exfiltrate data altogether. So he uh, he popped up and you can see the image here. Uh, he popped up an image, you know, mess with the best, uh, die like the rest, hack the planet. Uh, so he, you know, he wanted to show that he could physically do it and he wanted his presence to be known. But uh other ne'er-do-wells would probably want to be hidden secret and uh, send the data out and there would be no trace of it whatsoever. Now, the fell, uh, they said that uh, they he obtained the Celebrate gear in a truly unbelievable coincidence as he was walking and saw a small package fall off a truck ahead of me. The incident does seem truly unbelievable. Marlon Spike declined to provide additional details about precisely how he came into possession of the Celebrite tools, because like I said, the software would probably only be uh, present if you physically went to Celebrite. Uh, The fact that he says that he obtained the physical hardware that Celebrite uses um, because it fell off a truck in front of him, that is pretty obviously a lie. Essentially, uh, you know, essentially to say that, uh, no, he he bought it somewhere, black market, secondhand, or, you know, had someone on the inside actually sell it to him. But still, he had his hands on it. Uh, in an email, Celebrate, a, a Celebrite representative wrote, Celebrate is committed to protecting the integrity of our customers' data, and we continually audit and update our software in order to equip our customers with the best digital intelligence solutions available. The, represent, the representative did not say, If the company engineers were aware of the vulnerabilities, Marlon Spike detailed, or the company had permission to bundle Apple software. Um, Yeah, so with that being said, the the vulnerabilities could uh, could provide fodder for defense, defense attorneys to challenge the integrity of forensic reports generated using Celebrate software. Celebrate representatives did not respond to an email asking if they were aware of the vulnerabilities or had plans to fix them. So with that being said, it's, um, yeah, and uh, the implications are big for, I guess, kind of legal reasons. If you can cast any kind of doubt on the data that is presented to you, 
you got yourself a problem. You know, it's uh, if there's even a sliver that, uh, you know, they were targeted in a particular case, you have questionable, you know, suspicion that something happened. Uh, do I think anything has happened? Do I think they've been hacked by anyone else other than these people? Probably not. Uh, but going after security researchers is becoming more and more of kind of like a fun uh, thing for hackers to do and more so for Signal because they're obviously on the getting hacked end of this equation more often than not. But as far as uh, this goes, hacking hackers or hacking the company that owns the hacking software, it's like, yeah, it's a badge on your chest. It's uh, proof that you are better than the experts, than the professionals who sell their services to, you know, governments and police agencies around the world. But the question is, you know, how, how often has it really been done? And yeah, there you go. So they have one comment here, um, through Ars Technica, which I always appreciate the comments. Uh, they have a very insightful audience, but they're saying that to me, uh, the, remor- the remarkable part is that apparently no Celebrate customer performed even superficial security checks on a device built to handle crucial evidence for investigation. Uh, he said that, uh, he said, what does this say about their security practices? Essentially, you know, uh, did he ch- have any customers, governments, uh, you know, three-letter agencies, police departments, have have anyone really checked the credentials and the validity of, you know, just these companies that they're dealing with on a regular basis? Uh, sounds like no, but uh, like I said, who's going to f- hack uh Who is going to hack a company that should not have any hardware or software available to customers or in the wild? Like I said, most of it is probably held in their research facilities, uh, in their own facilities. Um, It's not that big a deal, but it is pretty funny that Signal, uh, you know, the the CEO and founder of Signal decided to uh, take this down. Or uh, probably not the CEO, just the founder of Signal. Still... Very, very interesting stuff. Let's go ahead and continue on here. Lots that we can talk about. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Hmm. How about... How about... We talk about... Let's see. I, Foxconn. This has been a slow-moving train wreck, and I cannot move... Well, you know, I just can't keep myself from watching it. Wisconsin, known for their cheese curds... And soon, maybe, there are LED panels and phone screens and things of this nature. Well, no. Looks like, for the time being, they will continue to be known only for their cheese curds because the Foxconn facility that they promised to build drastically scales back plans for the $10 billion Wisconsin factory. If you don't recall, they did a lot of soul searching. Foxconn did a lot of wheeling and dealing, and that led them to get like in the neighborhood of billions of dollars in tax subsidies. And yes, they do make the best cheese curds. I hear they squeak when you chew into them. So that's uh, who doesn't want food that squeaks back at you? But still, onto this facility, instead of the thirteen thousand jobs, and to keep that into perspective, that is like state changing. Like I understand why they did it. If they got this kind of facility and this kind of revenue uh, flowing through their state, Wisconsin would have a much different budget than it currently does. Uh, You know, 13,000 high paying tech jobs would be amazing for any region. And then again, probably for the entire states. Well, turns out that's actually going to be only 1,454 positions. Just one tenth of what it was supposed to be. Now, they're saying that uh, they they initially promised a $10 billion investment in the area, and instead the company will spend $672 million into the project under the new deal with the state. At first, Foxconn said that it would create 13,000 new jobs, and now you're looking at, once again, 1454 According to Foxconn, the reduced scale of the project affords the company the flexibility to pursue business opportunities in response to changing global market conditions. 
It claimed that the original projection used during negotiations in 2017 have at this time changed due to unanticipated market fluctuations. What they're saying there essentially is, uh, due to COVID, we can't. And by the way, they were woefully behind schedule before COVID was even a thing. So yeah, they just took uh, recent market fluctuations as an excuse to not do what they were probably never going to do. Now, when the company and state officials announced the project, Foxconn pledged to build a manufacturing facility uh, at the campus, which spans 20 million square feet. It said it would make advanced flat panel displays. Eh. However, Foxconn aims for the campus have long been in flux. It ditched plans to build build state-of-the-art displays in favor of smaller, less advanced ones. Uh, but of course, that did not come, pa- come to pass either. So before, they were going to build the displays of the future. And then they were like, well, we're going to build the displays of the now. And they still didn't do it. In early 2019, Foxconn considered shifting focus from manufacturing to research and development. Uh, to research and development. After critics attacked, uh, after critics attacked the proposal, the company gave reassurance that the ca- that the campus would have manufacturing facilities as well as a research hub. And what that saying that uh, what that is saying is essentially, instead of thirteen thousand good paying manufacturing jobs in their facility, Foxconn would instead employ a couple of hundred scientists to do research and development. Now, once again, they are scaling it back to. 1400. Uh, They said that the chairman said that the company is making medical devices, servers, and communication equipment in Wisconsin. He suggested it may build electric vehicles there as well. I see that as uh, probably not that much of a possibility. Now, the latest deal between Foxconn and Wisconsin reduces the planned subsidies, which is perfect because, again, the subsidies for this $10 billion investment had them seeing $4 billion in tax cuts and tax incentives. You are losing so much. And then think about all the other uh, expenditures that would probably come along with this. Uh, It was... It was looking like this was just going to be a wash, like as far as, uh, you know, kind of people's uh, taxable income could go. But here we go. Now, here we go. Foxconn is eligible for $80 million in tax credits, down from $2.85 billion. So I'm really glad that they lost $2 billion in, uh, in tax credits because, you know, they didn't deliver and they should in no way be able to keep those. Now, they said that uh, those credits are in line with those for which any company is eligible. They're uh, performance-based and will depend on whether Foxconn has uh, hits capital investment and employment targets. So, yeah, Foxconn no longer getting the white glove special treatment. Instead, they are getting the same uh, the same deal that every other major uh company gets for investing in Wisconsin. Uh, The state had already spent hundreds of millions of dollars on the project, and according to Reuters, uh, records show that Wisconsin had shelled out north of $200 million in tax exemptions, road improvements, and grants for training and employment. As of 2019, the village where Foxconn campus is based uh, is paid, uh, I'm sorry, is based, had paid around $152 million to buy and demolish 132 properties through eminent domain and along with almost $8 million to cover relocation costs. Essentially, this thing has already cost taxpayers hundreds of million, uh, hundreds of millions. And then on top of that, it's, uh, you know, just not really going to come to fruition, or at least, you know, now we're scaled down to one-tenth of what it was supposed to be. Um, I mean, again, I get it. I get it, Wisconsin. That kind of investment, that kind of facility, and that many jobs would really uh, put Wisconsin on the map for tech manufacturing, which would, which would be amazing. Uh, but they they chased it too long, too hard. They wanted it too bad. And I really do believe that Foxconn, uh, you know, kind of played them for fools and tried to get every little bit of tax credit incentive out of them, which led them to be just a, 
you know, just a big old boondoggle. So there you go. Foxconn, and that story is not over, I guarantee it. That story is not over yet, but hey, hopefully soon. Let's go ahead and continue to our next story, because that was story number four. Story number five. How about, how about some record setting? And this will be the most oxygen made on Mars. It's pretty cool. Uh, for a major step forward, and obviously for space exploration, and if you're going to have astronauts eventually make it onto Mars, well, you need something for them to breathe. You need something for them to eat. You need something for them to live in. But most notably, something for them to breathe. Because, hey, it's going to make life there a little tricky if they can't do that. An experiment on board NASA's Mars Perseverance rover has extracted breathable oxygen from carbon dioxide for the very first time in uh, on an extraterrestrial world. The milestone is an important proof of concept for more advanced technologies that will be necessary to support human exploration of the red planet. Uh, saying that the Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization uh, Experiment, or MOXIE, is about the size of a shoebox and sits near the front of the frame. Moxie sucks in Martian air, which is 96% carbon dioxide, heats it up to about 800 degrees Celsius or about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's crazy hot. And plucks the oxygen atoms out of the carbon dioxide using a process called solid oxide electrosis, or I'm sorry, electrolysis. Now, scientists have uh, been eager to demonstrate on-site oxygen production on Mars for decades, but this is the first experiment that actually was able to do it. They said that MOXIE was uh, successful in producing this and that they were able to, well, produce enough oxygen, yep, produce enough oxygen to keep an astronaut alive for 10 minutes. Obviously, something the size of a shoebox is uh, more than the size of a shoebox is going to be needed to keep a permanent settlement or, hey, you know, just people running around for a couple of hours. But still, it's proof that you can actually do it on Mars. And they said that oxygen isn't just the stuff that we breathe. Rocket propellant depends on oxygen and future explorers will need to uh, will depend on producing propellant on Mars to make the trip home, which makes sense. Uh, You know, you produce enough oxygen, you condense it down into liquid oxygen and hey, that's rocket fuel. They said that blasting a crew off of the surface of Mars would take about 55,000 pounds of oxygen, about 25 times as much as Mars-based crew of astronauts would need to breathe over an entire year. So you need to produce a lot of this. Um, Let's see, let's see. So they said it, uh, it would be far more economical to manufacture this key gas at the Martian surface with a future scaled up iteration of MOXIE which scientists estimate would weigh about one ton, then it would haul 25 metric tons of Earth oxygen across the 33 million mile gulf between the planets. So there you go. Um, Yeah, they'll continue to test its oxygen-making abilities over the next Martian year, a period of 687 days, potentially meeting its peak production at a rate of 10 grams of oxygen in an hour. Though this, uh, though this is just a demonstration, it paves the way for future exploration. Uh, could you imagine a future where we have enough, these, enough of these things and we could just plant them all over Mars that, yes, you know, you could make liquid uh, fuel with them. You can, of course, breathe the air. And, hey, with enough of them, actually terraform the entire planet. Although, to be fair, uh, I think... Earth's atmosphere is only like 23 or 28% uh, oxygen. I'm not really recalling which one it is. But yeah, you really don't need that much oxygen uh, in compare, you know, in comparison to the entire environment to actually be breathable. Although you need a lot less carbon dioxide. Let's uh, be very clear about that. So, good job NASA, always making new strides. How about how about we talk about um, 
Tesla and this whole thing. So a couple of days ago, we talked about this on the show, Tesla, fiery crash, this whole thing, uh, what actually happened. And Elon Musk came out swinging after it saying that, you know, you can't even turn on autopilot without someone in the driver's seat. You can't, um, you know, you need to constantly pay attention to the wheel. Essentially, there's no way that this crash could have happened. Uh, we need to get to the bottom of this. Whereas, you know, uh, when first responders showed up on the scene, it was very clear and evident that there was no one in the driver's seat. So, and he was also claiming that autopilot could not have been uh, engaged because of this fact. Now, with that being said, though, last Saturday, two men died when a Model S crashed into a tree uh, in a residential neighborhood. Uh, Elon Musk tweeted that data logs recovered so far show autopilot was not enabled. It turned out, well, yeah, this could be... uh, a little tricky because Consumer Reports decided to test this latter claim by seeing if it could get Autopilot to activate without anyone in the driver's seat. And Consumer Reports, well, reported that it's really not that difficult at all. Saying that sitting in the driver's seat, Consumer Reports' Jake Fisher enabled Autopilot and then used the speed dial on the steering wheel to bring the car to a stop. He then placed a weighted chain on the steering wheel to uh, to simulate a driver's hands uh, and then hopped into the passenger seat. From there, he could reach over and increase the speed using the speed dial. Seeing that autopilot won't function unless the driver's seat belt is buckled, but it's also an easy defeat by threading the seat belt behind the driver. So, yeah, not that hard at all saying that uh, in our evaluation, the system not only failed to make sure that the driver was paying attention, but it also couldn't tell if there was a driver there at all. You would think something simple like, and I know that they have cameras facing into the cabin, I know that they have constant, or they have weight sensors, but as long as they're checked in the initial, you know, kind of initializing of autopilot, they are not checked continuously through autopilot. So they said that in our evaluation, the system not only failed to make sure that the driver was paying attention, but also that there was a driver there at all. And they're uh, they're calling for more robust monitoring. Uh, Now, they say that uh, Fisher sees these problems as evidence that Tesla has fallen behind companies with more robust driver monitoring systems. Companies like GM and Ford use uh, driver-facing cameras to detect the driver's face and ensure that they are looking at the road. You know, not looking down at a book, a magazine, looking at their phone. Uh, No, actually looking at the road. Uh, Consumer Reports also suggested that Tesla could use the weighted sensor on the vehicle's driver's seat to determine if there's a human being sitting behind the wheel. These sensors are already used for seatbelt warnings and airbags, among other things, so it would not be a major leap to actually program a vehicle to turn off features like cruise control or anything else if they don't detect a person. In hindsight, in hindsight, it seems obvious. To Tesla, I'm sure the conversation went something like, why would someone purposely try to trick our system? Why are they trying to get out of the driver's seat with autopilot engaged when they know that would be a very dumb thing to do? But, hey, humans are very dumb things. And they're going to try to play the system. And honestly, this did not seem that hard to game at all. They said that... uh, the investigation makes it clear that activating autopilot without being in the driver's seat requires deliberate, uh, deliberately disabling safety measures. Uh, he had to buckle the seatbelt behind himself, put a weight, uh, put a weight on the steering wheel, then crawl over to the passenger seat without opening any doors. Anybody who does this knows exactly what they're doing. Tesla fans argue that people who deliberately bypass safety measures like this have only themselves to blame if it leads to a deadly crash, which, yeah, I think most people would agree. If you are deliberately evading Tesla's safety measures, you kind of get what you're looking for. Still, Consumer Reports argues that the government regulators should require more robust safety checks and, uh, and make it almost impossible to activate autopilot without someone in the driver's seat. The most obvious thing there would be, you know, like GM and Ford, uh, make it so that the camera detects if there's someone in 
the driver's seat or if there's even a face in the driver's seat. And if not, bring the car to a stop and there you go. It's uh, it, it would not be that hard, but again, I'm sure that the conversation of Tesla went something like, why would people do that? No, no one would, would be that stupid to actually do that. Uh, little do they know, they're always making better idiots. So, there you have it. Um, and, you know, honestly, regulation is great and all, but I don't think they're going to be able to regulate fast enough in this particular field. It's, uh, it's a very... It's a very niche problem that only affects one car maker and one automaker. Um, if anything, there should probably be standards and almost like sharing of this technology among competitors. So obviously if Ford and GM had shared what they had learned and what they're doing with Tesla, then you know, you wouldn't have had this problem. Maybe the same calls for artificial intelligence in the designing and development of artificial intelligence between different companies, uh, for everyone to work together, maybe self-driving cars should have the same thing so that you don't have multiple kinds of self-driving cars and just one uh, software. Though, obviously, profit margins would take a hit because then, you know, less competition. If it's open source, uh, you can't sell it or you can't sell it as easily. So that will probably never happen, even if it should. Okay. There's that story, story number six, story number seven. Let's go ahead and talk about, uh, you know, we can go from Tesla to Tesla and then get into a little bit of Apple, but Tesla's solar panels and power wall batteries are becoming a package deal. So no longer can you just buy one or the other. You have to buy both. Check this one out. Saying This one from Engadget and uh, uh, Mr. Richard Lawler saying that uh, if you're still thinking about getting a Tesla Powerwall or equipping your roof with the redesigned solar panels, it should probably uh, you should probably consider getting both or going elsewhere entirely. Musk revealed in a tweet that starting next week, Tesla solar panels and solar roof will only be sold as an integrated product with Tesla Powerwall battery creating the kind of brand synergy he's been seeking. And the tweet right here saying that uh, obviously you can only be, uh, you know, you, you can only purchase these things together, saying that solar power will feed exclusively to Powerwall. Powerwall will interface only between utility meter and house main breaker panel, enabling super simple install and seamless whole house backup during utility dropouts. Uh, they reported last month that Tesla's website had started telling potential buyers that uh, the only way to get in-demand battery would be to order solar panels as well, so it looks like this policy works both ways. Beyond the, uh, beyond the tying two big ticket items together, they mentioned that Tesla can unlock higher capabilities for free via software upgrades next month. Uh, for Powerwall 2, and that for new installations, solar power will feed exclusively to the battery. Of course, uh, Electric also mentioned even if you already have a contract with Tesla for your panels, it may have altered the deal with a higher price than originally estimated, citing roof complexity. So, yeah, if uh, you were a fan of these and you were thinking about getting one of these and, you know, kind of whole home generators and whole home backups are becoming more and more popular, uh, yeah, you have to buy both. You have to buy both. Um, there you go. Pretty simple story. Not too much there. Let's see. So, I think that for our next story, we're going to talk about what do you really own? And this is a conversation that probably deserves its own show. But when you make deals and you make accounts and you start purchasing things, a lot of people assume that they own something. You know, if you have a uh, if you have a you know a Blizzard subscription and you have World of Warcraft and you you know you pay for the base game sixty bucks, you pay for the or you know the base game forty bucks, you pay for the expansion sixty bucks, you pay the monthly fee fifteen bucks, you know you're one hundred and twenty dollars in, you start playing the game and you think that any kind of progress or anything that you do within the game is yours exclusively. You know, it's yours to uh, it's yours to own a you know kind of I own this blah blah blah. 
In actuality, though, when you purchase all those, you're essentially signing an agreement with Blizzard that, hey, you don't actually own anything. You have the rights to rent and use the product as they see fit. But if at the end of the day, you decide to bot on the account, if you decide to cheat or do anything like that, you know, kind of play offline, you can't do any of that. And they can actually revoke everything and close the account. Because, again, you don't really own it. That's what a lot of people don't realize about about a lot of these online services. You are agreeing to the service, and even if you pay for the service, you are paying for access. You are not paying for ownership. And that is what this gentleman here, instead of Blizzard or Battle.net, that's what they are running in with Apple. And a gentleman with an Apple ID with 24 thousand dollars worth of content well it was closed and he's suing apple for deleting it now uh, apple has been hit with a lawsuit alleging that its media services terms and conditions which permit the company to terminate an apple id are unlawful and unconscionable the complaint filed tuesday with the uh, district of uh, northern district of california goes after an Apple services clause that states a user with a terminated Apple ID cannot access media content that they've purchased. Uh, Through its terms and condition, Apple retains the rights to terminate an Apple ID. More than that, the claim says that Apple can terminate an account based on mere suspicion. So even without, and that's obviously just legal jargon, so that they don't have to officially prove it, you know, 100%, they can just say that, well, based on these factors, we suspect, and we did. And yeah, they just take it out. They say that uh, Apple's unlawful and unconscionable clause as a prohibitive de facto liquidated damages provision, which is triggered when Apple suspects its customer have breached its terms and conditions. Um, yeah, additionally, the, the complaint claims that the user... Uh, the users with Apple devices will find their products substantially diminished in value if their Apple IDs are terminated, since they won't have access to Apple services or purchase content. You can imagine trying to use an iPhone without a valid Apple ID. Uh, You wouldn't be able to download any apps, you would not be able to access any kind of information through any of the Apple services, and... Yeah, it would essentially just be a giant weather or a very expensive little weather device. I mean, there aren't many services that wouldn't work without a legitimate Apple password. Uh, The plaintiff in the case uh, reportedly spent about $25,000 on content attached to his Apple ID. When they terminated his Apple ID for an alleged violation of his terms and service, he lost access to all that kind of content, to all that content. I would be curious, you know, kind of what actually happened. So they mentioned, according to the complaint, which is actually filed here, you can see it in its entirety. uh, They said that the plaintiff also alleges that Apple uh, prevents users from accessing unused funds attached to an Apple account. So, for example, he had seven dollars preloaded into iTunes credit. And when they did that, you know, when they canceled his account, they prevented him from essentially using that uh, that money that he had put in there. So with that being said, uh, it does claim that Apple shut down the Apple ID without notice, explanation, or policy, or process. It goes on to claim that the conduct, specifically the clause resulting in terminations, are unfair, unlawful, fraudulent, and illegal. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is why... No one actually reads the terms of service. You would like to think, and you would hope, but what these people are suing Apple for, you could sue 99% of other companies with some kind of virtual app or software. You could sue them for the exact same thing because they all try to hold these rights as well. Uh, I'm very interested to see if this will hold up in court. Now, they said that the lawsuit is seeking class action status, and uh, you know this is going to apply to anyone who had a closed Apple account at any point. It asked for a jury trial seeking a permanent injunction barring Apple from engaging in allegedly unlawful behavior, restitution of funds lost during the account termination, damages, and of course, as any good lawsuit, attorney's fees. So... 
Uh, class action would be pretty premature. Uh, I don't know how many people would be strictly affected by this, but yeah. I, I would also be curious why they terminated his account. That seems like a pretty big, obvious uh, question. And whether or not they could do it, I mean, they've been doing it for 15 years. Uh, I'm sure this has come up before, but it's always good to kind of test the legal waters once again. Uh, I'm just curious why they, you know, canceled it. Uh, they said that, let's see, reading some of the comments here, they're saying that if the plaintiff has indeed egregiously violated Apple's terms and conditions, uh, they say that, uh, you know, maybe it should be acceptable that they terminated his entire account. Uh, you know, kind of why did they ban him? But obviously, preloaded money, money that's been put on there and kind of held for now but no access to, that would be highly illegal. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's... Um, I would like to think that if he wins here, people would have a similar argument against Apple, Amazon, Google, uh, John Deere, uh, you know, Android, all these different devices. This is this is definitely something that would be consumer friendly, but it's not been going that way for so long that it's hard to imagine it not going the way of Apple, but. I would love to be pleasantly surprised that uh, you know we're we're going to see kind of a uh, a change here. So um, I think our last story will do something fun as well. Linux, yes, the entire organization and body behind Linux has banned the University of Minnesota. How could that happen? Well, turns out they were sending out buggy patches in the name of research. And they said that uh, the exchange between uh, a PhD student of computer science and engineering at UMN and uh, Greg Crow Hartman, saying that uh, I respectfully ask you to cease and desist from making wild accusations that are borderline on slander. These patches were sent as part of a new static analyzer that I wrote, and its sensitivity is obviously not great. I sent pack, uh, patches on the hopes to fix. Uh, I'm sorry, on the hopes to get feedback. We are not experts in the Linux kernel, and repeatedly making these statements is disgusting to hear. Obviously, it is a step in the wrong direction. Uh, let's see. Wait, I'm sorry. It, obviously, it is a wrong step, but your preconceived biases are so strong that you make allegations without merit, nor give us any benefit of the doubts. I will not be sending any more patches due to the attitude that is not only unwelcome, but also intimidating to newbies and non-experts. Oh my God, the Linux community being, uh, you know, kind of uh, very harsh to, uh, you know, to newcomers, I'm shocked. But here we go. Uh, UMN apparently sent another round of obviously incorrect patches into the kernel in, in the form of a new static analyzer, causing distaste to Greg Hartman, who has now decided to ban the university from making any further contributions. And uh, let's see, so the response to that whole thing, so essentially the student is saying, I'm not an expert, I sent some stuff out that was wrong. I'm sorry, uh, I won't send any more updates because you guys are real jerks and yeah, stuff like that. Now, the response from Greg Hartman saying that you and your group have publicly admitted to sending known buggy patches to see how the kernel community would react to them and published a paper, I'm, I'm sorry, published a paper based on that work. Now you submit a new series of obviously incorrect patches again, so what am I supposed to think of such a thing? They obviously were not created by a, stati by a static analysis tool that is of any intelligence as they are the result of totally different patterns and all of which are obviously not even fixing anything at all. So what, I, what am I supposed to think here other than that you and your group are continuing to experiment on the kernel community developers by sending such nonsense patches? Uh, when submitting patch, uh, patches created by a tool, everyone who does so submits them with wording like found by tool XXX, and we are not sure if this is correct or not, please advise, which is not what you did here. You're not asking for help. You are claiming that they were legitimate fixes, which you knew to be incorrect. 
Our community welcomes developers who wish to help and enhance Linux. This is not what you are attempting to do here, so please stop trying to frame it that way. Our community does not appreciate being experimented on and being tested. So with all that being said, uh, there's an update here which we're not going to be able to get to, but the head of the Department of Computer Science for the uh, for MNU and they had the following statement saying that we take this situation extremely seriously. We have immediately suspended his line of research. We will investigate the research method and process there. So essentially, now the department head is uh, reaching out. Nice little juicy, uh, I don't know, uh, gossip, I guess, to uh, end this up on. But everyone, thank you for tuning into Computer America. Once again, thank you for listening to us on IRN, and thank you for listening to us here on the program. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much.